Okay, here we are for week three, already a quarter of the way through the course. So, exciting stuff this week, attitudes and um, personality. So, let's just zip through the bits. These are the areas that we're going to cover this week. And I'll move straight into the action stuff. I really annoyed myself, actually, by using ABC here. Um, ignore that bit. Um, it's not a good mnemonic, as they say, to help you remember things. Uh, definitely A is for effect, and B is for beliefs, um, but behavioral intentions um, does not equal C. So these are the three key components of um, an attitude. And I have to say that behavioral intentions is something of a latecomer um, within... <coughs> within the academic world of, of organizational behavior. Um, so affect or feeling or emotions, uh, whichever way you want to call it, uh, is that um, it gives, um, sometimes gives attitudes a little bit more extra clout, a little bit of extra uh, shape. Um, it does not just consist of thoughts and decisions and cognitions and, and mental stuff. It's also got some emotional content. Um, however, in addition, this third factor is the behavioral intention, which is the degree to which you intend to act um, according to an attitude. We'll talk a little bit further about these issues, but just keep in mind these are the three components, um, and intentions in particular are a great way of um, predicting behavior. They um, magnify one's ability to predict whether something's going to happen. If you say, I am certain that I'm going to spend the next three hours absolutely certain reading a um, my organizational behavior textbook from Robbins, then it's much more likely that that will be the case than you just say something vague like, um, you know, I'm planning to study tonight or, you know, I believe education is a very good thing and I believe getting good marks are great. They do not reflect the same degree of intentionality. So, I will first run this little video and then I will show you the next one. This video is actually really good quality. I might play it and also the volume down and talk over the top of it. So attitudes and behaviours don't always correlate. There's always there, there is some difference sometimes between it. And this little video talks about when they do match and when they don't. So just pause there. If you have a specific attitude, like an attitude towards using recycled shopping bags, that's much more predictive of behaviour to use recycled shopping bags than a more broad attitudes such as green attitudes, environmental attitudes, are predictive of particular behaviours. This is an American video, so you'll get stuff about guns and a little bit later about hunting. So the theory of planned behaviour is by a couple of American guys called Azen, A-J-Z-E-N, and Fishbein from memory. And as the slide very accurately states, attitudes towards behaviour, specific behaviour, combining with norms of what's happening around us. So, for example, on the environmental front, um, in Australia, we have very strong anti-littering norms. In certain countries that you might travel to, there are much weaker anti-littering norms. And people may have very strong litter or no litter uh, attitudes, but they will express them much more, um, they'll be much more likely to be expressed in environments in which uh, the norm is to uh, behave in a particular way. So, you know, uh, visitors from rather messy countries to Australia tend to, um, you know, conform with the subjective norms of the country when they come to visit Australia. They don't suddenly turn into litter bucks. Not always, but it doesn't uh, generally happen. Similarly, we may be more likely to litter when we're in a context that it is um, highly normal to do so. 
Perceived control is also a big thing. I, I mention control, control and control quite frequently in these lectures because control has been shown to be that little extra element that does add predictability. If you, um, for example, um, you know, if you um, believe in, um, you know, using less fuel and you think hey, giving a hybrid car would be a great idea, but you simply can't afford it, you don't have the ability to carry out that action, you lack the control over the situation, then there's not going to be a great correlation between your um, uh, ability to believe in uh, hybrid cars and your actual getting a hybrid car. Intention, as we said, is a very important predictor. The importance of attitudes important is a thing, you know, in, in terms of its centrality of an attitude towards you, what's what's actually you. Self interest, obviously, deep held values. I should pause that. So family influence, group influence, peer influence. So attitudes tend to be more stable when they come from personal experience as opposed to just talking about it or hearing about it, or watching it on telly. And those attitudes that you've got personal experience about tend to be ones that you bring to mind more easily. You know, they're salient, as we say. Top of mind is another way of putting it. Okay. The classic... Um, the classic, uh, we're going to be talking about job satisfaction in a minute, but um, the relationship between job satisfaction and the rewards is something I'm also going to bring up in a second to do with something called cognitive dissonance. But you'll notice in this study of different studies that it's a very flat relationship between high pay and low pay and amount of pay satisfaction. If you look at the next slide, there's actually a reverse relationship. So the more you get paid, the less job satisfaction, which is a bit more of a global form of satisfaction. Pay satisfaction is one of those focused satisfactions and job satisfaction is more global uh, satisfaction. So money and satisfaction in jobs do not necessarily correlate. And, you know, some of the personality correlates of job satisfaction rather than money is things like neuroticism, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, and uh, which is a, which is has a negative association with um, job satisfaction and extroversion, which is the flip side of introversion. And extrovers extroverts tend to be more likely to have job satisfaction than introverts. So the importance of the attitude, the degree of correspondence, but or, or, or degree of focus between the behavior and the attitude. Sorry, I'm quite tired tonight. Um, the accessibility of the attitude, which relates to one's personal experience. It's the degree to which one can bring it to mind, as well as the existence, existence of social pressures and norms that tend to shape and drive behavior. Sense of control is very important. Degree of escape refers to the degree to which this is, uh, by the way, this is a factor that I invented, so it's not something that will be in the exam, but my PhD was on this topic, and looking at the degree to which we are forced to focus attention upon the discrepancy between our attitude and behaviour is also a variable that affects the, the linkage between attitudes and behaviour. If we can't escape the fact we're being hypocritical, we tend to reduce our level of hypocrisy. Now, some important job attitudes is is job satisfaction. Now, uh, job satisfaction is highly related to performance or significantly related to performance, but a lot of managers behave as if it isn't. They focus mainly on production uh, or profitability, some of these big Ps, but not um, focusing on 
the degree of job satisfaction. Uh, it tends to be higher, job satisfaction in Western countries, and it's interesting to question why. Could it be that we're paid more? But as we saw from that scale, not likely. Uh, it could be because um, jobs are more central to um, uh, self, um, self belief, self esteem in Western countries because we're an individualist culture as opposed to a collectivist culture. So, possibly job and self identity is very closely wrapped up in countries like Australia, for example. However, job satisfaction doesn't necessarily lead to people deciding to stay in their job. For example, you can be very dissatisfied with your job but still stick at it um, simply because. Um, you know, the, the job market is very poor, so there's these macro issues, these, these issues in the environment around you that block you from shifting, so you can still be unsatisfied and stay. Job involvement and engagement, very similar notions, and that relates to the degree to which the job grips you, the job engages you, the job involves you and makes you, you know, the, the day passes quickly when you're engaged in the job, whereas if you're bored and disengaged, um, you're counting the minutes and watching the clock. And psychological empowerment, which also relates to the issue of control, and the ability to feel that you have uh, make an impact at work. So employees respond when they aren't happy. There's these two dimensions from destructive to um, creative or, or positive and from active to passive. Um, I don't know what that's doing there. It's a leftover of another slide, I think. So. A destructive, active um, response would be to leave the business. A destructive, passive response would be neglect or engage in um, antisocial or anti-organisational behaviours. We'll talk about them in a minute. Passive but um, positive would be loyalty, sticking with the business and backing it up. But positive and active would be voice, where you express, um, where you express something. You, you speak up the chain and talk down the chain to your inferiors or your, your staff below you or the staff above you. Uh, or, or engage in organisational citizenship behaviours, for example, would be a, um, another positive, uh, active response. And we'll talk about OCBs in a minute. So when they're not happy, it tends to be, um, when, or sorry, when they are happy, um, employees tend to perform better, as we've said, engage in those OCBs, organisational citizenship behaviours. Those are the little things that are not in your job description, but which are positive contributions towards the health and prosperity of your organisation. Um, so little things like, oh, um, there's an oil slick over there, there's a risk of an accident, reporting that to the janitor to have it fixed um, would be a OCB. It's not your job, you don't have to do it, you could just walk on, but you worry that there could be an accident at work and you do something about it. It also relates to when employees are happy, customers tend to be more satisfied, and absenteeism definitely goes down. So. On the flip side of OCBs is the counterproductive work behaviours. We've got deviance, um, and with deviance can, consists of, you know, um, uh, slothful work practices where you do not try or with quality, for example, uh, or you go slow. Um, there can be aggression, which you uh, the defense is more passive version. Revenge is more the active version, where you actually, you know, sabotage a work process or um, spread gossip um, or take actual negative active action uh, against either employees or the company itself. You could do that by talk, speaking badly of your company in the in the general public, for example. And aggression, of course, things like bullying and all that sort of things. Some active. Um, active forms of uh, negative or counterproductive work behaviours. Really recommend if you, over the Christmas break or some other time when you feel like it, getting this book out, Cheats at Work, fantastic book. It's quite a engaging and funny read at times about the, the way um, people actually who aren't happy at work or underpaid in particular actually milk more out of the system. Um, there's great stories in there, for example, about how bartenders uh, cheat with the amount of alcohol they put into glasses, and um, in order, and then they stock up the little bits of leftover whiskey, for example, and sell it on the side. Um, so it's a way that they 
supplement the income illegally. Um, the flip side of absenteeism is presenteeism. You need to be aware of that term, which means people who stay at work, um, even though they're sick, for example. It tends to be a version of OCB. Um, so it's a positive thing. You're trying to do the right thing, but it can be quite negative because presenteeism, you might be spreading your germs at work, for example. Unionisation is another response to um, dissatisfaction and quitting. Um, so unions tend to be more active in, in workplaces where there is problems. They do tend to improve those problems, but it's a symptom when unionisation starts that you do have a problem with your um, work workers and their satisfaction. Cognitive dissonance, I'll play this clip. Psychological story. But I will focus on this section here. In the mid-50s, Leon Festinger and his colleague Merrill Carl Smith conducted a experiment in which students were engaged in very boring tasks. The students were then given a request by one of Festinger's staff. Okay, that's fine. Uh, let me tell you now what we're actually studying here. It's the effect of preparatory mental set on performance. The rest of the subjects are prepared by being told that the experiment will be very interesting and enjoyable. In fact, lots of fun. Uh, now I have a somewhat unusual request to make of you. Uh, the next subject is waiting right outside, but the fellow who ordinarily gives the spiel uh, isn't here. Uh, I wonder if you could possibly take his place. As a matter of fact, we figure we'll be needing someone in the future, so I'd like to offer you a $20 retainer and have you remain on call for us. Uh, would that be all right? $20? That'd be fine. Half the students were... Okay, so there's the setup. This is all rubbish, by the way. Psychologists often run experiments in which they lie to the participants, and this is a classic, and I mean literally classic, 1957, this experiment took place. The man in the white coat tells the student, who's just done this half hour of really boring work, so to speak, um, has told him that, um, you know, there's another student coming in, would he tell that student uh, that this boring work is actually fun and pleasant to try and recruit him, uh, and he pays him $20. Now, there's two conditions, it's the $20 condition, Festinger and Carl Smith is the name of the two um, are the names of the two experimenters here. Um, pay them twenty dollars to do it, or two dollars to lie to a fellow student, which is a counter attitudinal behaviour which makes you feel bad or causes what you call dissonance. Okay. Now, the real test came a little bit later, where the um, the student was then asked the one who just had to go and lie to the other person, what did you actually think of that boring task? And they compared the results of that attitude scale towards that boring task um, from the, the ones who were paid $20 and the ones who were paid $2. And the ones who were paid $20 had a much worse attitude towards the boring task than the ones that paid $2. Kind of counterintuitive. You'd think the more you get paid, um, the more you'd like the job. Because effectively you got paid to lie, and you got paid to lie about the job. Um, what in fact seems to happen, this is what cognitive dissonance does, is it creates a, when you've got a discrepancy between an attitude and a behaviour, you it creates dissonance or arousal, that's negative arousal, and you try and bring the attitude and behaviour somehow together. The behaviour is already done in this case, but the attitude shifts towards the behaviour. And the thing is, when the, in the $20 condition, what they posited, what they suggested, was that the $20 condition provided sufficient explanation for their behaviour to say, OK, I hated the job, but I said it was wonderful because I was paid 20 bucks. Whereas in the $2 condition, you couldn't resolve the dissonance using the money. And instead, you had to resolve it, say, by saying to yourself, well, actually, it wasn't too bad after all, was it? And that seems to happen, that internal shift caused by the arousal, caused by the discrepancy between your attitude and behaviour and the one that has no justification. Interestingly, on the issue of control, they found when they um, didn't make the students feel like they had any choice in the matter, they were not. They didn't have to resolve the dissonance by changing their attitude. They didn't change their attitude. So, notice the guy said, "Would you mind doing this, etc.? Um, can you help me with this?" He didn't say, "I order you. I. You really have to do this." When they did 
changed that experiment to that kind of setting, the attitude change didn't take place. So control is uh, a factor here yet again. So talking about values and you know personality is, is what we're going to, personality and values are what we're going to be talking about in the second half. This is the second chapter. Um, personality is the sum total of ways in which an individual interacts and reacts with others. Measurable traits, as it says there, traits are kind of like smaller parts of personality. Um, both traits and personality are assumed to be um, relatively stable. They do not flip-flop all the time. Great story here, which uh, I notice my picture is intruding on about um, these two twins who were separated at birth. Um, now the reason we, we're so interested in twins that are separated at birth is that twins, genetically identical twins like these two ladies, they have what's called the same nature. They were born with um, the same genetic heritage. However, because they were separated at birth and brought up by different mums, they had different nurture. So the nature versus nurture debate asks us, what's the most important part in making us who we are? Um, our genes? Or the way, we're, and it's not just genes by the way, sometimes the intrauterine environment, you know, in your mother's stomach, does affect elements of your personality later, certainly per elements of your life. So it's not just genetic, but it's what you're born with, nature, and nurture is what comes with you, comes to you through your experiences in life, from your parents, uh, your family, broader family members, your peers, schools, education, all that sort of stuff. That's nurture. What's really interesting about this story is that it was done deliberately. They've been deliberately separated at birth with the cooperation of their birth mother as part of a um, unique study on nurture versus nature. It's extraordinarily anti-ethical, unethical, and um, they only happened to find out about it. And um, apparently this guy showed no remorse and offered no apology. Extraordinary. The science is not worth that kind of human cost, I have to say. That's from the Telegraph from the UK. Okay, we've got the Myers-Briggs personality measure. So we've got a couple of big personality measures. Just need to become familiar with this Myers-Briggs type indicator. Quite a few of you may have heard about it. It's often used by HR departments to measure the type of person people are, the type of person potential recruits are, so that they can see whether they'll fit in with the culture of the organisation. Classifies people into one of 16 basic personality types. And they are often characterised as like ENTJ. So E is extroverted, N is intuitive, T is thinking, J is judging. Um, and if we have a look over here, ENTJs tend to assume leadership roles and solve organisational problems. They can be pushy when putting their ideas forward. And an example would have been Napoleon, apparently. That's that chap up there. Now the problem, the problem with um, the problem with the Myers-Briggs is it has been relatively poorly related to job performance. The scores tend to change with time as you go older or younger. Um, well, you don't grow younger, obviously, I wish. Um, not suitable. It's not suitable for measuring old and young people. Apparently, when you work with under 18s or retirees, the, um, it has very poor predictive performance. It has very poor uh, stability. So it's a controversial measure. However, the big five is a much more reliable measure. So we know we're all familiar with extroversion, you know, introvert, extrovert, party types for extroverts, bookish types for introverts, conscientiousness, is, as you can see there. These are quite good descriptors, but the one thing I do want to bring up to your attention, you can remember this one through Canoe or through also another acronym is OCEAN, O C E A N. So worth remembering. Now, here's a number of other variables that relate, and the textbook talks about these um, in brief, about these other personality variables that are quite key. Core self-evaluation. Um, we tend to have positive self-evaluations. 94% um, of university lecturers think they're above average. So there you go. We're all, none of us are immune to these um, pervasive self core self-evaluations. Machiavellianism is when people are highly um, manipulative in 
working a situation to their advantage. For example, in a workplace, they may deliberately spread rumours about one of their rivals for promotion or deliberately stymie some of their work so that a rival's work doesn't succeed or a rival's project so that their project looks more successful relative to their rival. That would be a Machiavellian um, behaviour. Narcissism is self-loving. You've probably heard of that one from a uh, Greek youth who looked in the mirror and fell in love with himself. Self-monitoring is an interesting one. It's associated with leadership but by the way, less commitment to organisations. It's this ability that comes when you've got like this little screen at the bottom uh, of a little camera upon yourself and you're looking at yourself perform and you're judging yourself and then tweaking elements of yourself in response to that judgment. Hmm, you sound very arrogant, Olaf, tone that down. That type of, that's a self-monitoring. Risk-taking, pretty, pretty obvious. Type A personality, that driven uh, type A versus type B, and if you've got the textbook, you can actually go online to my management labs and do a type A, type B personality test. Um, though there's a whole bank of really good tests in the my management lab that comes with organisational behaviour, and in my honest opinion, is actually worth the price of the textbook alone. So it's a really, really impressive. I'm a heavy type A, so I'm driven to work and workaholic, almost you could say. Um, it does come with some definite uh, health consequences. Proactive personality is a person who takes um, active. You know, you don't just passively wait for me to send you an email about an assignment topic. You go hunting for it on Moodle. You're a proactive person. And we'll skip that video because it won't play. Um, so values, it's a pretty good. Uh, basic convictions. A specific mode of conduct or end is personally or socially preferable to an opposite mode of conduct. So right versus wrong. We've got terminal values, instrumental values. Now terminal values are uh, where you'd like to end up. The terminal is in the airport terminal, hopefully. Um, where, where you'd like to end up, what you'd like to achieve. Instrumental values are the ones that help you get there. And a value system is a bit of a, a deceptive phrase. It's not about a system of values that hang together in particular ways, like conservative values or liberal values. Um, it's actually a hierarchy of based on ranking of an individual's values in terms of their intensity. This is the most important value for me, and I really feel it strongly versus I feel this one less strongly. I uh, won't play that, but Milton Rokic is the name that's most often uh, and it's Rokic Value System, RVS, I believe. And you have a look, terminal values, instrumental values. Terminal values can include, you know, let's say, achieving self-respect and instrumental values is clean living or broad-mindedness that will get you there. Now, there was... Um, a nice little comparison in the textbook. And you'll notice that, for example, these are the two extremes, executive versus activists. And, um, you know, executives tend to have, um, you know, high on their list. The top five of values includes, um, or terminal values include self-respect, family security and freedom, which are shared by activists, but not in the top two, but in the bottom of the top five. And they've got accomplishment and happiness and the activists have got equality and world peace. If you have a look at the instrumental values, similarly there's three in common between, you know, one end of the extreme, people who are focused on careers, etc., and activists who are focused on expression of particular values. Um, and the instrumental values that they share are honesty, responsibility and capability, but courage and helpfulness is more important to activists and ambition and independence more important to executives become a bit familiar with personality job fit theory and the fact it's John Holland. It has a very strong relationship with um, job satisfaction and turnover, which means staff turnover in work. Um, these are uh, six different types of personality um, worth having a look at. I also wanted to focus briefly on power distance. I mean, sorry, but you know, these are a number of different um, dimensions on which uh, countries vary. Um, so power distance, collectivism versus intercollectivism is more common in you know, Asian 
um, societies, individualism in, uh, you know, like in America, Canada, Australia, to a large degree, femininity, masculinity. These are variables, as you can see, most of the countries in this list, in fact, all of them are moderately masculine, um, except Turkey, which has a moderately feminine. These were due to, a, this was a broad analysis of X amount of um, societies, uh, and uncertainty avoidance, ways in which societies vary. I want to focus on power distance, though. You may think that power distance relates to um, um, one's, you know, for example, the distance that between you should need to keep between you and your boss in a lift, for example. That's not what power distance is. Power distance relates to tolerance of differences in power in different societies. So um, in Australian society, we have a very egalitarian, um, blokey, um, matey sort of attitude towards even bosses. Um, all right, if uh, President Obama came into the room versus um, ourselves, we might feel a little bit more different or the vice chancellor of the university. But, you know, between myself as a lecturer and yourself as a student, there's a much closer gap in Australia than there would be, for example, in Russia, uh, where academics have a very high standing and students are considered to be significantly below them. The higher power distance, in other words. It's a concept you should be aware of. This particular study had a look at a heap of different societies, 62 societies, and um, in addition to power distance, uncertainty, avoidance, collectivism, and future orientation, they also looked at humane orientation, assertiveness, gender egalitarianism, and performance orientation. And they divided these societies up into a group you should become a little bit familiar with. You won't be examined on what are the countries, but you'll notice that Anglo culture clusters include white South Africans, New Zealand, England, Ireland, etc. Now they looked at differences on those various um, elements, but they also looked at similarities and they looked at particular at leader characteristics that people found good quality leaders, searching for what different cultures regard as outstanding leaders, blah, blah, blah. And they found most universally desirable through to the least desirable. We'll have a look at the top. We've got integrity, inspiration, and vision. And at the bottom, we've got malevolent, which effectively means evil, self-centered, and autocratic, which means bossy. Non-participative means you're not getting involved. And they looked, they found six broad leadership styles, charismatic, team-orientated, participative, humane, self-protective, and autonomous. The most popular amongst all these nations was charismatic, which actually includes visionary, inspirational, but also some of the elements to do with risk, like decisive, um, down to the bottom, which is autonomous, which is self-centered, non-participative, you person who locks himself in the office. Notice humane, being nice as a boss, wasn't right up the top there. And finally, a word, we're up to the 33 minute mark, so I'll try and keep it brief, on um, personality testing. In general, we tend to test personalities with um, things like this. This is a survey I designed uh, to, for coal miners. I'm the life of the party that tends to measure quite accurately. That's an item from another personality scale that measures extroversion, as is I don't talk a lot measures introversion. I have frequent mood swings, it's neuroticism. Uh, I get chores done straight away. That's conscientiousness. Remember our canoe or ocean? Conscientiousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, openness, and extroversion. I like order. So the, all these ones relate to personality. What I wanted to make a point about, however, was the fact that we're not as bad psychologists as we think we are. If we look at these faces, we're probably capable of picking introvert, extrovert, introvert, extrovert, quite effectively. Um, they have looked at this in, um, there's a book called uh, Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. Um, Blink means effectively in the blink of an eye you can make an assessment about personality, about, um, for example, job candidates that come through the door. Um, there is evidence that 
we're able in, for example, 10 milliseconds to make quite accurate, 10 milliseconds is a very, very thin slice of time, a thin slice judgment as they call it, um, we can make quite accurate decisions about certain basic strata of, um, of personality, one of which is extroversion, introversion. So, uh, here we go. This is something that you need to practice with yourself. You need to actually form instant judgments. And then later on, when you find out more about the person, when you've made that instant judgment, make a few notes. And when you get to know that person, see how accurate your initial judgments were. If you find yourself quite accurate time and time again, and remember, you do have to write them down. You know, don't just say, oh, yeah, I was quite accurate. That's um, open to heavy bias. Um, but yeah, if you find you're good at this type of thing, then maybe you do need to, uh, for all of I've said over the last uh, three weeks about the importance of the scientific method, um, realise that sometimes intuition can be quite a valuable addition to your armoury as a manager. Thanks very much. We'll see you again next week. Um, and hopefully you're making good progress. If not, please do um, remember to email me o.merlink at cqu.edu.au. Done.